All right. So today we're going to be in the gospel according to John. We're going to be in the sixth chapter. And we're going to read verses 9 through 14. Here are the words of the gospel for us this morning. There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they among so many people? Jesus said, make the people sit down. And now there was a great deal of grass in the place. So they sat down, about 5,000 in all. And then Jesus took the loaves. And when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, gather up the fragments left over so that nothing may be lost. And so they gathered them up. And from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled 12 baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, This is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. This is the word of God for the people of God. And we say, Amen. 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 Will you bow your heads in a word of prayer with me? Heavenly Father, we again give you thanks for this time together. And we now ask that you would send your spirit upon us. Break open our ears and our hearts so that the words that are about to be spoken would truly become your words for your people who bring us into better relationship, not only with you, but with each other. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. We're in the last sermon of the series. This brand new beginning, and I'll say it, I've said it since we started this whole process, and I'll say it yet again. We are in the time of new beginnings. After all the stress, all the meetings, all the prayer that I know each and every one of you spent your time on your knees, just like I did, we are on the other side. One of the things that I love doing is listening to books. I don't normally have enough time to actually sit down in my den and read the books, because if I'm in my den, there's something around the house that needs to be done. <laughs> But I love still listening to books, so Audible has become my best friend. And so I'll listen to books while I'm traveling in my truck all the way over the way. When I'm doing chores around the house, I have my earbuds in or my phone on and I'm listening to books. And I listen to all kinds of different books. I listen to theological books by great theologians of history and modern times. I listen to uh, guides and things from pastors who have already proven the fact that they actually do know what they're doing. Um, but most of the time I listen to books that just are pleasurable. Stories that I can dive into and just get lost in. I recently finished reading, or listening to, whatever you want to call it, um, a, a really special book to me. Uh, probably about the 15th or so time I've listened to it on Audible, plus all the times I read it in my youth. It's the book of The Hobbit. Any of y'all know that one? <laughs> Safe to say it's a book I'm quite familiar with. In the story, Bilbo and the dwarves are trying to get to the Lonely Mountain, but three quarters of that book is all about the journey to the mountain. The journey is fraught with fear, pain, loss, and untold amounts of stress. Throughout the book, Tolkien wants us to note that there are countless times that Bilbo states the same phrase, it's like he copy and pasted every time. I wish I was back at home with my tea <laughs> in my wonderful little hobbit hole. That's right. I, I wish I was home. And it always said the same thing after it said that. It says, and this wasn't the last time he said that. <laughs> But in the book, as they finally reach the Long Lake and the Lonely Mountain, they get to the root of their home. The journey is complete, and they look up to the side of the mountain, and they realize something very important. The journey is now over, but the quest is about to begin. The dragon is still to be dealt with. The treasure is not theirs, and the Lonely Mountain still has a rather horrible king that needs to be deposed. We here at Needville U UMC are like that unexpected party of 13 dwarves and a hobbit. I'll take the 
place of Hobbit, all right? So none of, none of y'all think, oh, they, he, he thinks my feet are, 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 are furry and I'm short. That's not, okay, I'm the short one, all right? <laughs> I'll be the Hobbit. <laughs> but we've made it through the wilderness of COVID, Snowmageddon, whatever you want to call that horrible ice storm that we had, the, the flood that came from that, a denominational schism, and everything that caused was through that. And we are coming out the other side of that journey. But just like the dwarves and, and Bilbo at that moment, they finish the journey, they look up and they find the quest is still in front of them. We have finished our journey, but the quest is still in front of us. We need to reclaim the power that resides within this congregation to build the kingdom of God. That is our quest. Always has been. And it begins with what we started this whole series off with. Remembering and forgetting. Right? Remembering what God has already done so that we can remind ourselves over and over and over again that God is faithful to His promises. That God takes care of us. That God still has a plan for us. Remembering, even if it's hard, even if it's harsh to do so remembering the excuses that we've given and the reasons why we went down the wrong path we made the mistakes we have built those ruts that we've been stuck in for a long time so that we can break them so that we can know how to avoid them when they rear their ugly heads again because they will but then on top of that forgetting those bad times so that we don't dwell there so that we truly do look for the hope and the future that God has for us. Last week we talked about how to do that, the refocusing of our minds and our eyes on things. It's not enough just to say, well, I'm going to forget what's... We need to have something that we're actually focused on, or else our minds and our eyes are going to go back to that negative time, and it's going to consume us. And so last week I talked to you about the fact that Forgetting doesn't mean to leave it alone. We will pray for our brothers and sisters that will stay within the United Methodist Church. We will pray for all the churches that stay within that denomination. And we will pray that they continue to build God's kingdom in their way. But at the end of the day, we also understand that nothing that happens within the Texas Annual Conference or the United Methodist Church will affect this congregation starting on January 1st. So we need to refocus ourselves. And we need to refocus ourselves on the two things that are most important. The first being on Christ Himself. Refocusing our hearts, our personal faith journeys onto the true north. We are here for a purpose. And our focus needs to be refocused on making sure that we fulfill that purpose. And then we need to focus outwardly because that's the whole part of the mission right Jesus didn't call you to himself just to say okay congratulations you're done he called you to himself so that you could go out and get bring more people to him I told you last week that self-care is a great and wonderful thing and I think that our congregation really was in that self-care mode through COVID, through the flood in the fellowship hall, through everything that's happened in our congregation over the past two years. I think it was something good for us to look in and make sure that we were okay. But the time for self-care is over. Our focus has to start turning back to the outside so that we can follow the calling of Christ. In last week's sermon, I specifically pointed out that we need to get back into the habit of invitation, evangelism, and growth. All, of the th all those things which, over the past couple of years, hasn't stopped. It's not like we haven't brought in new members. It it's not the fa fact that we haven't gone out into our community. It's the fact that we haven't done it enough. Right? But they cer those things certainly have been on the back burner because there have been more important things to talk about. This week, uh, so that's what we wanted to talk about last week. And this week, what I want to do is I want to speak to one other area that we as a congregation have kind of slacked off over the past couple of years on. And this new beginning gives us an opportunity 
to get it back. And that is our giving has to come back. Now you all know me. I've been here for almost five years. I think I've done maybe three whole sermons on finances, on giving, on offering, tithes and all that kind of stuff. I hate talking about it. And I hate especially talking about it from here. But it does bear repeating that of all of Christ's messages and lessons that he did, the vast majority are on money. It's no secret that this congregation has been scraping by financially over the past couple of years. All of y'all have gotten the letter and you've heard me talk about it. You've heard Bart talk about it. You've heard a couple of other people talk about it, about the fact that we have been scraping by. But before I get into the fact of, oh, well, how do we fix that or anything else, let's start where we should, shall we? We start with God. That's the first note in your sermon notes this morning because it is God who gives everything. Bottom line in all this, if it hadn't been for God, those doors right over there would have been shut a long time ago. If it hadn't been for God taking care of us, we wouldn't be here right now. We would all have different homes. God has provided what we needed to stay open and running, and He will always provide what is needed. So before we get into the what 10% is, or what a tithe is, or any of those questions, let's take a second to understand this very, very first principle. Everything belongs to God. Period. We are simply borrowing from Him. There's a story that, uh, y'all know how we pastors work. We have like a a small book of stories that we pass around to each other, right? (laughs) No one knows the origins of 99% of it. There's a, story that, there, there's, a, there's a story that goes around with the pastor that says that one day a group of scientists got together. They started talking about all the great and miraculous things they were able to do through science. And finally, at the end of the meeting, they all came together and decided that they no longer needed God. The world no longer needed God. And so they picked the brightest scientist in the group and said, you go and tell God that. So he goes up to the mountain and he finds God. And the scientist walks up to God and says, God, we don't need you anymore. We are to the point as a human race that we can clone people. We can manipulate atoms. We can build molecules. We can fly through space. We can do so many miraculous, wonderful, amazing things with our science. We understand the world in such a miraculous and wonderful way. We don't need you anymore. Why don't you go away? Mind your own business. Go find another world to take care of. Because we are fine. Now God, because He's God, listens to the whole thing patiently, kindly. And at the end, He says, okay. How about this? Before I go, let's have a little contest to make sure that y'all really are at that level that you say you are. Let's let's have a human-making contest. Scientist says, okay, we can can do that. I told you we could clone people. We we, we got this. God says, but we're going to say the same rules like back in the old days. Just like I created Adam from the dust. Science says, okay, we could do that. No problem. He says, when do you want to start? We'll start right now. So scientist bends over to pick up some dirt to go back to the science lab, and God says, ah, 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 ah. Find your own dirt. <laughs> One of the great theologians of our time, Carl Sagan, is quoted as saying, to really make an apple pie from scratch, you must begin by inventing the universe. Before we talk about what to give, how to give, how much to give, what you should give, all that stuff, we need to first realize that nothing that we give was ours to begin with. It was always God's. It will always be God's. In the story of the fish and the loaves, the boy's lunch wasn't something that he created either, was it? 
The story tells us that it's a young boy that shows up with the loaves and the fish. Well, let's see. A young boy in that time and period was, at the best, barely an apprentice to his father. But more importantly, he was probably still in school. He hadn't learned how to fish yet. There's no way he caught those. He hadn't learned to bake yet. He didn't know how to bake. Those weren't his. More than likely, when he left the house, his mom said, Don't forget your lunch! And handed him his sack lunch for the day. Even what he gave to the people, even what he gave to Christ, wasn't his to begin with. Someone else had to give it to him. And that's what we want to start with. This idea that there's nothing that we have that was really truly ours to begin with. And that goes to everything. Not just what's in our bank accounts or what we give in the, po in the plates on Sunday morning. Our lives, the very breath that you draw, the soul that is in your heart, it all started from Him. There's nothing that we have that wasn't His to begin with, isn't His currently, I, even though we might be the ones that have control of it at the moment, and won't become His in the end. And so with that in mind, let's look at the story. Now, I love the story of the fish and loaves because there's just so many lessons to be learned and gleaned from this small boy. But the most important lesson is always as always, it's the most obvious. The boy gives not a feast, but gives what he's got. And that's important for us because it's the next note in the sermon notes this morning. We give what we have. Now trust me when I say this, I would love to serve a congregation where every single member has a spare extra million dollars sitting in their bank account that they could give to the church every year but that's just not the case. It would make these sermons completely go away, right? But that's what's so hard about these types of sermons, about tithing and giving, because as a pastor, I know that there's a number of people in this congregation that this sermon is not meant for. There are plenty of people in here that give already to the church and give exactly what they're supposed to give. The purpose of the capital campaign that, that you see in the poster and, and this sermon is not to give you is not to get you to give more than you already give. It's to ask everyone the same question. Am I giving what I am supposed to? For some people, the answer is yes. I'm giving exactly what I'm supposed to. I'm giving my 10%. I'm giving my time. I'm giving, all that kind of stuff. I had a member in a church once that was a wonderful follower of Christ, wonderful member of the church. The man and his family lived paycheck to paycheck. I know every single person in here has either experienced that themselves or know of someone that has had to live that life. I remember sitting down with him on a number of occasions trying to help him with his finances so that he could have a little extra for a birthday here or a vacation here or whatever the case was. There just wasn't anything there. Unbeknownst to, the church, to his church family, he and his family were frequent visitors of our food pantry at the church. Frequent visitors into the church office to help pay bills, to keep the lights on, to keep the roof over their head. Giving money wasn't something that they could do. There wasn't any money to give. But when the youth group needed some extra adult help, do you know who the first one to raise their hands were? When the trustees came out and said, we're going to have a, a work day, you know who was there an hour before the work day started and was there long after the work day was supposed to be over? In the story, the boy comes to Jesus with his sack lunch. A couple of loaves of bread. 
and some fish. He doesn't go home and try and get a steak from his mom. He doesn't go home to try and get something else. He doesn't cover his basket thinking that it's too small or too poor for the master. What he does is he gives what he can. He gives what he has. Now, as I said, I'd be lying if I said that I, would, I, I, that I hope this message would bring some of us back into the habit of tithing. That's the whole point, right? Because some of us have gotten into that habit of not giving anymore. For some, it's been a reason of conscience. But as we've talked about over the past couple of weeks, that reason's gone. I know that some got out of the habit during COVID because you weren't in, in the sanctuary. It's hard to do something when, you're not, when it's not presented in your face, right? It's time to change. Now, I'm not here saying that I expect that when Sharon and, and Betty go into the office this, this morning after service and count the money from the offering plate, that they expect to have over $12,000 just happening in the plate so that we can fill this board completely by the first day. That's not what I'm expecting. But I will quote uh, a dear friend of mine. Uh, he's sitting right there, Bart, <laughs> who spoke at the church council, the church conference. If everyone who called themselves members of this church gave what they were supposed to, what they should, what God asked them, what God told them to give, we wouldn't need this. I wouldn't be three paychecks behind. we wouldn't be asking for this and I wouldn't have had to write this sermon. And we wouldn't owe anything to the annual conference of the Methodist Church because our apportionments would have been paid a long time ago. And so my statement to you this morning is be like the boy in the story. Give what you have I'm not asking for anyone to go into the poorhouse to give back to the church. But what you have, don't give any more, don't give any less than what God has asked you to do. Because when you give what you have, when you give what you're supposed to give, it's the last message note in your sermon notes, it's that time that miracles happen. We know how the story ends. I read a little bit of piece of it, right? But depending, depending on which story you read as far as the feeding of the 5,000 or the feeding of the 8,000 or whatever, whichever story you happen to be reading, not only does it feed everyone, but there's extra. In one particular gospel lesson, the extra is enough for 12 basketfuls of bread. One for each of the disciples. That small sack lunch for the boy is able to produce enough food that everyone ate to their limit. It doesn't say that each person got one bite and they had to stop. It says everyone was satisfied by the meal. And there was still leftovers. We serve and worship a God of miracles. The God who created the entirety of creation through His Word. Out of nothing. You really think that Jesus had a hard time feeding 5,000 people? It doesn't matter what you have to offer. If it's big, small, whatever. God can do extraordinary things with it. Now, I am no prosperity gospel preacher. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that if you give a certain amount of money to the church, you're going to get it tenfold back in your bank account. That's not how this works. That's not the miracle we're talking about here. When I talk about the fact that a miracle happens when the church gives, the members give to the church, the miracle that happens is the miracle of the building of the kingdom of God. The miracle that happens is the fact that maybe one person that wouldn't have found Christ finds Christ. 
The miracle is the fact that someone who didn't know who God, that God even existed, didn't know that God needed them, that, he, that they needed Him, finally finds that one piece that brings them full circle. And one more soul is saved. That's the kind of miracles that our God produces. The miracles aren't for us. The miracles are for the mission. The building of the kingdom. What can your tithe do? I have no idea. But wouldn't it be exciting to find out? Think about this story for me, with me for a second. When that boy handed the sack lunch over to, let's say, Peter, because right, the disciples go out, because Jesus tells the disciples, go out and find what the, what the people have got, right? Peter walks up to the boy, and the boy hands him over his sack lunch of loaves and fish. Do you really think that the boy handed, it, handed, that, to Je- handed that to Peter, thinking, I have fed the 5,000? My little sack lunch is going to take care of all of it. Of course not. But it did. There is no telling what your little gift can do until you give it to Him. After everything the past couple of years this, that God has done for this congregation, how can we not trust Him? And if we trust them, how could we not give everything to him? The last piece that I love about this story, and I want you to think about it real hard. Go back in Jesus' ministry to when he was alone. We call it the temptations of Christ, remember? What was the first temptation? Jesus hasn't eaten for 40 days and 40 nights as he wanders through the wilderness. And the first thing that Satan does when he sees him is, Turn these stones into bread and eat because you're famished. I've told you before, in that story of temptation, Satan never lies. He is the great deceiver, not the great liar. He uses the Scriptures to tell a false story. He tries to get Jesus to do something that he shouldn't do. Which means that when he tells Jesus, all you have to do is speak and the stones will turn to bread, guess what? He is truthful in the fact that all Jesus does have to do is speak and the stones will turn to bread and he will eat. When you think about it that way, you realize that when Jesus goes in front of the 5,000 and the disciples sit there and say, how are we going to feed them? All Jesus literally had to do was tell all the stones in the area to turn to bread and they'd be fine. But what does He do? Go find me someone with something to start with. Why? Jesus doesn't need anything to start with. God doesn't need anything to start with. He has it already. It's because Jesus and God want us to be together. To work together. It's not the fact that God can't do it without us. It's the fact that He doesn't want to. He wants us to have a hand in the mission. He wants us to have a hand in the building of the kingdom. He wants us to be His accomplice in this great feat. Part of the giving that we give, whether it's the tithes in the plate, or our time, or our skills, whatever it is, that is our way of being part of His kingdom, of His mission. When we give to His bride, the church, We are hand in hand with the one who can create all of it with just his words. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, you 
give all things. The food on our plates, the roofs over our heads, the electricity and the lights, the grace that flows through the people. Everything comes from your hand and from your seat. You could easily do this by yourself, Father, but you ask us to be part of it. And we are so grateful. We are so grateful because we want to be desperately. No matter how many times we falter, no matter how many times we go the wrong way, we pray that we can be part of it. That we can do good. That we can do the right thing. And so, Father, we pray that you would give us the strength to give like that little boy did in that field. To give as the disciples gave. To give everything to you, knowing that you will take care of everything. We give you thanks for this church. We give you thanks for everything that you have given to us. And we pray that we can be worthy of those gifts. And that we can work side by side with you in the building of your kingdom here in the salvation of souls here and that even if it is just one that one would find you that didn't know you were there we pray all this in Christ's precious name Amen <laughs>